September 2012, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave a notorious presentation to the United Nations about Iran's nuclear program. Netanyahu claimed that Iran was close to finishing a nuclear weapon with which to threaten Israeli security. The talk, illustrated with cartoonish graphics, was compared to Colin Powell's equally infamous UN presentation about Iraq's supposed WMDs. But in April of this year, the US signed a deal with the Iranian leadership on nuclear proliferation, which, as The Guardian reports, President Obama dubbed historic. The online magazine Vox reports the substance of the deal. Iran will have to give up most of its nuclear centrifuges, barring the most rudimentary and outdated, and will give up 97% of its enriched uranium. The White House cheerfully trolled the Israeli leadership by imitating Netanyahu's presentation imagery to suggest that the deal cut Iran's nuclear weapons capacity to almost zero percent. The response from the Israeli government was swift. A capitulation to Iranian dictates, Israeli officials told the Times of Israel. Netanyahu, as the Israeli Daily Haaretz reports, has told his cabinet that the chief worry now is that Iran will honor the deal. Justifiably so, since, as the New York Times reports, Iran's political leadership has fallen in line behind the deal. Is Israel truly worried about an Iranian nuclear weapons capacity? Or could it be that, as Haaretz columnist Amir Oren suggests, Netanyahu is worried that with this deal, Israel is deprived of an enemy to mobilize against and justify its own proliferation? For even amid the Israeli frenzy, some truth slips through. The Jerusalem Post report on Netanyahu's warnings about the deal contained this remarkable slip from Netanyahu. The deal leaves Israel with significant nuclear capabilities. It doesn't dismantle them, it preserves them. Quite right. Israel, as The Guardian reported in 2014, currently has 80 nuclear warheads, which is almost entirely unmentioned in the press coverage of this deal. Predictably, however, the American right is as alarmed about the deal as the Israeli right is. Republicans, explains The Guardian, are furious. Charles Krauthammer, a leading neoconservative, anatomizes the disaster the deal represents in the Washington Post. Iran's entire nuclear infrastructure is kept intact, he says. David Brooks in the New York Times argues that Iran is still trying to find a revolutionary anti-Western order and is not to be trusted. But the heroes of the right-wing anti-deal argument are not neocons, but old-fashioned real politickers, the two former Republican secretaries of state, Henry Kissinger and George Shultz. In their Wall Street Journal article, they maintain that the deal concedes that Iran will continue to have a nuclear capacity and thus represents a defeat for the United States. Nor is it just the right, however. Elements of the Democratic Party establishment, such as Mort Zuckerman, a billionaire real estate investor who also owns media such as the New York Daily News, for which he writes his own columns, are also up in arms about the deal. Zuckerman claims that under the deal, Iran can do almost everything they want. Meanwhile, even those liberal pundits who support the deal in the US press begin from premises that are alarmingly similar to those of the right. For example, Colbert King, the Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist for the Washington Post writes that the deal is a success because it prevents a genocidal leader and a barbaric country which has threatened to annihilate millions of Jews from gaining a nuclear weapon. Rarely is the US press more nakedly and unashamedly biased than when reporting on the Middle East. It's not just that in discussing the deal there is nary a mention of Israeli nuclear weapons or, for that matter, America's 4,760 warheads, the entire coverage is structured around a series of mythologies. While the neoconservative weekly standard worries that the Iranian Ayatollah Khamenei denounces the devilish intentions of Washington, it is Iran that is being demonized. The first and most important myth in the media's coverage is that Iran's nuclear energy program is a cover for a nuclear weapons program. For example, as the journalists David Morrison and Peter Oborn write for Open Democracy, the BBC makes this claim while ignoring US intelligence, which says the precise opposite. Barely reported anywhere in the media is the statement by US Defense Secretary Leon Panetta that the intelligence we have is they, the Iranian leaders, have not made the decision to proceed with the development of a nuclear weapon. Likewise, the International Atomic Energy Agency regularly verifies that none of Iran's declared materials are diverted to weapons making. As a recent report confirms, all of Iran's facilities are under containment 
and surveillance. And this is rarely mentioned. In fact, Iran's uranium is low grade. It does not have high enriched uranium capable of being used to produce weapons. Further, this picture was confirmed by the Israeli intelligence agency, Mossad. Now, this does not preclude military purposes. Many intelligence analysts argue that Iran's legal and compliant energy program provides a latent deterrent, wherein Iran is less likely to be attacked because it could produce nuclear weapons if threatened. Slightly better reported, because Obama drew attention to it in order to defend the negotiations, is that Ayatollah Khamenei has issued a religious ruling against the development of nuclear weapons. The majority of mentions for this story, however, are right-wing publications such as the Weekly Standard trying to debunk it, even though the full translated statement from Khamenei, available at Middle East expert Wan Kol's blog, demonstrates that the story is correct. The second myth is that Iran has threatened a genocide against the Jewish population of Israel and would use a nuclear weapon to make good on this threat, a consensus shared from the Washington Post to the Jerusalem Post. The claim is even repeated by Obama in comments reported by the BBC. Iran has threatened to destroy Israel, he claimed. Obama had made this claim prominently before at a 2011 UN address. The origin of this myth is in a series of reports from 2005 claiming that the Iranian president threatened to wipe Israel off the map. This claim was repeated widely from The Guardian to The New York Times. But just one problem, the story is utterly false. As reported in a rare moment of accuracy for the Washington Post, albeit only on one of its blogs, the opinion of experts is that the Iranian leadership had merely predicted that Israel would collapse. It is curious indeed that Obama and the US press continued to repeat this myth when it was debunked by the Israeli Deputy Prime Minister back in 2012. Israeli leaders don't believe that Iran would use a nuclear weapon against them. Israeli security officials, including former leaders of Mossad and the Israeli Defense Force, categorically refute such an idea. In fact, as reported in The Nation, the former head of Mossad says that Israel's own radical right is far more of a threat than Iran. In truth, Iran has far more to fear from nuclear-armed Israel, which has repeatedly threatened to attack Iran. One final myth is that Iran has a nuclear program because it is pursuing a revolutionary Islamist battle against the US and its allies. As is well known to politicians and journalists, but only rarely mentioned, Iran began to develop nuclear power in the 1950s in an agreement with the US. The Shah of Iran, the dictator imposed by the CIA and MI6 and backed by Washington, was a major champion of Iran's nuclear program. This was even used as an advertising strategy by American nuclear power companies. So if Iran is not accumulating nuclear weapons and is not even a serious military threat to Israel, why the charade of a negotiation to stop nuclear weapons programs that don't exist? This would not be the first time that imaginary weapons of mass destruction have formed the basis of a peace deal. In 2003, the BBC reported, Libya to give up WMDs. In the words of Prime Minister Blair, Libya had agreed to dismantle its weapons of mass destruction completely. But Libya never had weapons of mass destruction. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency pointed out that any program to obtain WMDs was in the very initial stages of development. The false narrative, however, served a purpose. Gaddafi was willing to support the war on terror in exchange for ending sanctions. Yet, having spent decades demonizing Gaddafi, the US and UK required that he make some gesture of guilt and penitence before they could welcome him into the fold. Once again, the US finds itself embroiled in a war, this time with the Islamic State. The Iranian leadership is prepared to align with the US, and its military is the most effective force combating ISIS in Iraq. The sanctions regime is proving counterproductive. Therefore, the empire needs peace with Iran, but it must make Iran a guilty and penitent party before it can achieve it. The Israeli intelligence establishment seems to favor it, Ephraim Halevi, former Mossad chief, writes for the Israeli news site Ynet that Iran capitulated, itemizing the capitulation point by point. He concludes, 
anyone who has followed events in Iran in recent decades has to admit truthfully that he never believed Iran would ever agree to discuss these issues, let alone agree to each of the clauses I've mentioned. The business press supports it. Forbes columnist Doug Bandau welcomes it. The financial newspaper Barron salivates about soaring stock prices if the deal succeeds. And The Economist emphasizes Israel's diplomatic isolation in the affair. The New York Times, the bastion of establishment liberalism in the United States and a traditionally pro-Israel mouthpiece, has produced an editorial denouncing Israel's unworkable demands about the deal. Even right-wing papers such as the British Daily Telegraph tend to support the deal. But even as a deal is reached, the myths of Iranian aggression and WMD proliferation continue to be useful in case Iran were tempted to change its alignments or elected a leadership that Washington didn't like.